Jesus basically predicts and gives them a prophecy that not one stone of the temple will be upon another. And of course, that would be fulfilled some 40 years later. Now, of course, the disciples are, you know, quite disturbed as well they should be. So in response to this, uh, they're going to ask him a question about what will be the signs of the end of the age or the end of the world. So we pick it up in verse 3 and Matthew records by the Holy Spirit that as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. So in other words, the first sign that would determine when the end is near will be many who will claim to be the answer, claim to be the Messiah. But they will be a false Messiah or a false Christ. And Jesus is warning them to not be deceived. Now, if you go back into the last hundred years, you'll find history replete with those who have claimed to be the answer, the Messiah, the one. Now, we, uh, in verse 6, continue on. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Verse 7, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now watch what he says here. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Now, if you have a King James Version of the Bible, uh, that's okay. Uh, you're, st you're still heaven bound and saved. Uh, <laughs> That was pretty bad. No, I love the King James. I use the King James often in my studies, but I, I have a problem with the King James in translating uh, this verse because it will say there in your King James Bible, uh, the beginning of sorrows, and you lose it completely. See, in Old Testament, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Old uh, King James language, sorrows was synonymous with birth pains. See, if you translate it as the NIV does in some of the other contemporary translations, you'll read birth pains there, as we just did, and that changes the whole complexion of the prophecy. Why? Because what do we know to be true about birth pains? Birth pains come in greater frequency, and they come with a greater intensity. So if you say just sorrow is there, you kind of, it's lost in the translation, if you will. See, this is what the Apostle Paul would echo in many of his letters. He would say that these would be like birth pains, like a woman travailing in labor. In other words, disciples then, in other words, church now, before I come, these things must happen. Not only will these things that I'm listing here happen, Jesus would say, but they're going to happen with greater frequency and greater intensity as he likens it unto a woman in labor with labor pains. Now, I've been teaching Bible prophecy for many years now, and on the mainland, uh, I taught, I've taught Matthew 24 many times. <laughs> uh, sometimes I've, I've wished I could have gone back and retaught it <laughs> a different way because I completely botched it. And I'm glad it was there and not here. <laughs> now, having said that, uh, there have been those who have questioned this uh, Olivet Discourse, as it's called, and brought into question the uh, increasing of earthquakes in terms of frequency and intensity. Now, I'm just going to give you a, a short answer to how I treat Bible prophecy, especially when I'm in the Gospels and it's coming from my Jesus. I find in the Scriptures that Jesus meant what He said and said what He meant. 
There's no riddle here. There's no ambiguity here. I mean, earthquakes are earthquakes, and they will happen in various places, and they will come with greater frequency and, and greater intensity. Okay? Now, someone challenged me with the USGS uh, data. This is many years ago. And I went and I started doing some research, and I found the following that the USGS contradicts itself, and the data is flawed. And I don't think you have to go too far. Well, maybe you do. Maybe you have to go as far as Haiti, or Japan, or now Chile, and Argentina, and who knows where else next. But listen, earthquakes are happening, and they are happening with greater frequency, and they are happening with greater intensity, just exactly as Jesus said they would. Okay? Now, I believe that Jesus not only describes earthquakes as being a sign of his soon return, but he also describes the tsunamis that will follow. Consider Luke's gospel, the 21st chapter. If you would, uh, please turn there. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Uh, uh, the third gospel, three, uh, 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 the third book over. Luke 21. Verses 25 through 28. Again, I'll read out of the NIV. Jesus says the following. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity. Why? They'll be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, verse 27, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. This speaks of the second coming. Now, verse 28 is a verse I'm sure you're familiar with if you've been coming here for any length of period of time. It's one of my favorite verses of all time. Because Jesus then in that context goes on to say, when these things begin, keyword, to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption draweth near or nigh. Did you catch that? Isn't that a little bit interesting that in the context of the end of the age, there will be earthquakes and Men's hearts will be in anguish and they'll be in perplexity. Why? Because of the roaring and the tossing of the sea. It's thought that what Jesus is describing here is what will come upon the world prior to his second coming. Now, I want to draw a distinction here, and we'll talk about this more in just a moment, but it's interesting that the second coming and the rapture, two separate events, are separated by the seven-year tribulation. Oh, here he goes again on the whole pre-tribulation rapture thing. Okay, already, we got it. Well, not so fast. See, I think it's incumbent upon us, especially now, in light of recent events prophetically that have taken place, that we know not only what we believe, but we know why we believe what we believe. See, we do no man no good by simply saying, well, I believe the rapture is before the seven-year tribulation. Okay? That's fine and dandy, and you're entitled to your opinion, and we all know what opinions are like. They're like armpits, so we've all got a couple, and sometimes they stink. When you add to that the why behind the what then you give them a reason and you give them an answer to every man of that hope that lies within you. It's not just a crutch or an escape that you believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. And I know many of you have come under fire, if I can say it like that, from well-meaning Christians uh, who have challenged you on your pre-tribulation rapture belief as if to say that, well, you just, you just want to escape. 